Meanwhile, the elves are bustling with activity. The Christmas Elf is a relatively modern cryptid, first appearing in 1850 in a book by Louisa May Alcott, but would not be publicly known until 1873, where Gaudy's Ladies Book popularized the image of elves in a workshop. The concept of the Christmas Elf likely coming from a variety of influences, including the Alfar, or hidden folk of Norse mythology, the Brownies of Scotland, and the Kobolds of Germany. No, not the dragon people from D&D. How long have you lived down here? Eleven days! How long do kobolds live? <laughs> Eleven days! <laughs> In 2005, a strange book popped up for Christmas. Elf on a Shelf. A Christmas tradition. This tradition was a newly invented one pretending to have existed for some time created by the author of the book. Well, yes, all traditions are invented. Generally, they develop more naturally through social interactions and not through someone cynically declaring that one exists. So people think it has existed for some time and they should participate and buy it right now. The Elf on the Shelf, a Christmas tradition book includes Santa's Scout Elf. Panoptes is the Greek word for all-seeing, connected to Argus Panoptes, a giant from Greek myth with many eyes all over his body who acted as the perfect guard as he could see everywhere. In 1785, Jeremy Bentham, founder of utilitarianism and connoisseur of bootlicking, went to visit his brother in Russia. He spent two years there fleshing out the concept of the Panopticon, a prison design where one guard could watch all prisoners, but no prisoner could know if they're being watched. The concept being that prisoners would always behave as though they're always under surveillance, and in so doing become their own police. But let's get back to waging war on Christmas. You can't escape my sight, Christians. I've got a non-denominational celebration ray gun. Before any Christians get mad, this is a joke. Much like this tweet. The war on Christmas has begun. Now is our time, Antifa super soldiers. Take to the streets and destroy Christmas once and for all. I'm sorry, stupid. Christmas isn't going anywhere. It's our way to give Jesus Christ our love. You demons, stay home. Speaking of demons. Elf on a Shelf is a small, creepy little doll that parents place around their house, telling their children that the elf is watching them, observing them, reporting their behavior to Santa every night so they better behave well, telling their kids to behave as though they are always under surveillance. You watch as I try to do as I should. Now, I doubt the person who created it understood that they were making an ideal panopticon for children, and that it's a method of making children aware of surveillance and in so doing normalize it. They were likely just extending the long-standing idea that Santa's monitoring you. He's there right now. He's got his eyes on you. You can run, but you cannot hide from his yuletide gaze. You better watch out. You better watch out. You better watch. This attitude also converts gifts from an act of kindness to a commodity that must be earned. Rather than it being an encouragement to the spreading of joy, it becomes about a transactional interaction. It also results in a lot of kids from poorer families feeling like they're not doing enough morally because rich kids get much better gifts from Santa. The fact is that commodity transaction has become a core aspect of how many people interact with this holiday and they teach their kids that it's built around punitive systems from an omnipotent surveillance apparatus. Santa's omnipotent punishment surveillance is itself an extension of certain Christian views on sin as a method of policing people, basing morality not in doing things because they are correct, because they make you feel good and help others, but doing them so you're not punished. Go watch my Midnight Mass video for more. The thing about punitive responses to actions is they're very poor motivation. What they teach people is they can do harmful things just so long as they don't get caught. So for it to be effective, one must convince people that no matter what, they will be caught. On top of this, parents' insecure need for control is resulting in teaching their children not to have a moral compass based in compassion, but a fear of punishment, all while removing any sense of privacy and degrading trust between them, as it tells the kid the parent believes they'll do bad things. Also, my Jewish friend DJ Cthulhu asked me to mention this. This culturally Christian nonsense has tried to push itself into other holidays. See, mention a bench, for instance. A gross attempt at making a Jewish elf on a shelf, whose creator loves harassing Jewish people who don't like it. For clarity's sake, I would like to clarify that the elf on the shelf is not a part of Hanukkah, nor is the abomination known as the mensch on the bench. For clarity, yes. Yes, I am. My book is all about the Maccabees and learning Jewish traditions. Abomination? That's my pal, Abominable Snowman, but his friends call him Abe. You have the wrong number of candles on your Hanukkah. Christians, especially capitalist ones, consume other cultures. You remember when earlier I said that Christmas elves came from other mythologies? Well, 
They were used to present small people happily working in workshops during an era where child labor disputes were occurring. To be clear, recontextualizing mythology is not inherently bad. For example, in the TV adaption of Neil Gaiman's American Gods, Argus Panoptes acts as the modern world's god of surveillance an embodiment of surveillance capitalism. The many cameras and devices of the world acting now as extensions of himself, like the many eyes adorning his body, discussing the modern through the reimagining of past art. Capitalists have been selling us self-surveillance objects for decades, and it's only getting more normalized to place listening devices into nearly everything we use. These smart devices are now being placed into children's toys, connecting them to the internet, and they're listening collecting data. Sounds like a ludicrous conspiracy theory, but it's very real. And these devices are not just being used by those who sell them to monitor you, though those companies are doing large-scale data collection for selling. It's also able to be exploited by other equally nefarious bad actors. In one of the most disturbing stories I've heard, one such smart stuffy connected to the internet was compromised by an older man. The mother, who had always hated the doll but kept it due to being a gift from grandparents, found her young child speaking with whoever had gained access to the device. I think we're going to be very good friendly friends. Let's talk about Black Friday. Look, a valued customer. Good morning, sir. Can I get you a tickly wiggly? Before we start, while I like the play, it does have some use of ableist language and a Jewish stereotype lawyer character that just sucks. Hi, Gary Goldstein, attorney in law. I was a little further back in line. Anyway, a knockoff Cthulhu named Wiggly has hatched a plan to take the world using tiny dolls of itself being sold on Black Friday. These dolls, called Tickle Me Wiggly, create the worst impulses of greed within people who grow violent over their need for them. He didn't even have a doll! What a waste of time. <laughs> I'll be spoiling the musical, so if you want, you can go watch it for free on YouTube right now, link in description. Okay, now that you've listened to the people sing and are sad about our best himbo, Ethan, dying. Nothing can harm you. Honest. Cross my heart. Hope to die. We can analyze the themes. The musical puts capitalism and its relationship to morality and holidays front and center. On this, the holiest day in America for humble merchants across this fine nation. From its parody of cheap cash grab Christmas movies. Jingle, jangle, if anyone sees two elves in my locker, I'll get expelled for sure. What are you two doing here? <laughs> the fuck am I watching? To the direct statements of Feast or Famine. Be there slashing prices. It's insanity! Do we have any morality? And it uses a specific recontextualization of a specific myth to do this. In his 1928 short story, The Call of Cthulhu, H.P. Lovecraft, the most bigoted author in history, introduced his audience to Cthulhu, an otherworld godlike being described as a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and forefeet, and long, narrow wings behind. In many stories, Cthulhu influences people into joining a cult, worshipping it, acting through its followers, from its dark realm of Rolaya to destroy the world. Wiggly is clearly inspired by Cthulhu, both visually and in how it functions. It creates a cult to destroy the world, acting through them. But it takes it in a new modern direction, as American gods did with Panoptes. Here, it's a personification of capitalism and its worst influences on people. The real existential horror was the capitalism we were subjected to along the way. Between 2006 and 2018, Black Friday events have left 11 dead and 109 injured in the United States alone. The music takes the real violence that occurs on that day and exaggerates it with its supernaturally affected greed. The Wiggly Dolls become the embodiment of all the objects people desire that cause them to violently try to take it from others. The people looking for Wigglies kill Ethan. Give me the fucking doll, I'm in a hurry! And Tom nearly dies from someone stabbing him to take his doll. The cult destroys the entire world out of their desire for Wiggly. The show very clearly places the blame on the systemic effects on people being what causes harm, and that those with power are the only ones who truly benefit. Linda, the richest character, is propped up and selected by Wiggly as its representative. As well, even though the President of the United States thinks he's a good person, Uncle Wiley, Wiggly's representative, calls him Wiggly's greatest ally. 
because he upheld and maintained the capitalist systems necessary for Wigley to take over, despite all his protests that... I can't be evil! I'm a status quo Democrat! I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. Uncle Wiley explains that... Only in America could Wigley take root! Do you think that in the Netherlands they'd give a shit about some toy? No, they're too busy enjoying their paid vacations and the free healthcare. To bring in Black Friday's sister musical for a moment, in The Guy Who Doesn't Like Musicals, the first in the anthology, in the song America's Great Again, we see the infectious spores of aliens compared to the encroaching fascism of Trump's America, with very direct allusions to Trump's followers and political statements. I think these two pieces together are critiquing the current status quo of American politics. So understanding Starkid's critique of status quo Democrat presidents, one must understand the ratchet effect in American politics, where inaction from people maintaining the status quo creates the space for others to shift the status quo to worse and worse places over time, all while continuing to do any pre-established harm. Note that the president's directly working with a drone strike loving military general. It could be anarchists, terrorists, socialists, Give me two hours, Mr. President. I'll organize a series of drone strikes. As well, in their attempts to respond to the situation with American militarism, sending a nuke into the dimension called the Black and White, they allow Wiggly to destroy the world. Uh oh, Mr. Pezziwez. It seems you've misplaced your bomby wom Don't worry. I'm sure it'll turn up somewhere. Moscow is gone, sir. It's saying that the motivating factors of capitalism leads to imperialist, warlike actions that are self-destructive. Note that in both of the anthology musicals, the actions of the government agencies only make things worse. America is Great Again is sung by the military members infected by the spores in the first musical, after all. Oh, oh yeah! The military! Oh, yes! As well, Wigley is able to do all of these things because the power is given by the people who are taking his eyes and ears. The dolls. What? You don't remember your catechism class? The father's a son. The son's the father. Wiggly rules on high in the black and white, but he also is the dolls. It's quite literally a powerful surveillance apparatus made of children's toys. Sound familiar? One which the musical draws parallels to Christianity, much like I did earlier when discussing similar devices. The world, and in particular capitalist America, sells their souls for a piece of Wiggly. A piece of capitalism. Do we have any morality? The motivations of Wiggly are also quite direct. Wiggly wants us. He wants everything. He's a knockin', and he wants in. As well, it is Peep, the government agency. Oh, we're a fairly small team. Just me and a few of my peeps. Which created the portals that allow for Wiggly to connect to our world, and it is Wilbur Cross, the former leader of Peep, who is Wiggly's right hand man. This reflects the real-world political concept of the revolving door, when members of the legislative body move from the government into the industries affected by that legislation, and vice versa. Fundamentally, the show is talking about the dangerous amount of influence and relationship between the government and capitalist interests. As Wiggly's influence grows, people begin to worship him like a god, much like certain types of people have come to treat capitalism as a religion. The person they treat as a prophet is the richest person in Hatchetfield, Linda Monroe, much like people have begun to worship and idolize figures like Elon Musk. Why do you people worship Elon Musk like he's a god? Because he is a god. Don't be jealous with him. Learn from him. Take inspiration from his struggle. If you think it's so quite easy to reach on the level he is now on, go ahead. Make yourself a brand just like his. I will surely make a post on you too. Elon has no character flaws. At all. He is one of the most compassionate and visionary people in history, and he is the most intelligent human. Elon Musk is nothing short of a genius and deserves each penny he has made. They are should feel lucky to even be beside him. I don't like these woke celebrities. Elon Musk is the man, and they are probably just jealous of him. Don't kneel before me. I Linda uses this influence to try and get herself commodities, in this case, a Wiggly doll. Ideally four of them. Note that the police are part of the cult. What the people who follow Wiggly don't understand is that they won't get anything from it, merely have things taken from them. I'm going to eat you. You know why it had to be a doll? It all boils down to belief. The people have been abandoned by everything. Everything except products. 
We're all made in America. In a valley of silicon. He wouldn't let us. All he wanted was you. Brian Saunders' dad character, Tom, sings the I Want piece. One Tim wants, Tim will get. Anything that he wants, he can have it. Because of advertising in society, Tom believes... He wants this doll! And thinks getting this commodity will help Tim, who is still processing the passing of his mother a year before in a car accident. It's just less frequently that you catch him in blue. What Tom is missing is that what Tim needs, and wants, is time with his dad and family. Tom is struggling with guilt over what happened. I don't say it enough. I'm scared you blame me for mom. I'm scared you blame me for your luck. Tom is, like many people, trying to fill a space where human connection should be with a commodity. He's scared to face his son and avoiding him, when what Tim needs is love and time spent together. Capitalism tries to teach people that our emotional needs can be satisfied by buying commodities, and Tom embodies this at the beginning. There's nothing I can fix. If he wants that toy, by God, I will take it. So he leaves Emma and Paul, the main characters in The Guy Who Doesn't Like Musicals, to look after Tim. This also harms Emma's want to connect with her sister's husband and have a family get-together. Tom's family's wants get pushed out of the majority of the show because he is drawn in by the allure of capitalist commodities. Tom only begins to process his feelings when he starts connecting and showing vulnerability with Becky. I was driving. That's my fault, she's dead. I killed my family. Becky has been dealing with her own pain and guilt. Tom and her dated in high school, but when Tom was shipped out to Iraq, she was left alone. She dated and married an older guy named Stanley, who over time showed his colors as an abuser. That's why you stayed with Stanley, that monster husband of yours. Well, right up until the moment he got bored and ran off. So that night I fought back. You say you killed your family. I hope I killed mine. So Tom, you've got to forgive yourself. Because if you don't, how is anyone ever going to forgive me? And they then sing Take Me Back about wanting to go back to their connection to each other. I've lost too much now to care. I'll never let you go now. In their connection and vulnerability, they help heal my heart and mend what's broken. But Wiggly starts pulling Tom and Becky apart, using their desire for the doll, emphasizing how the system gets even good people to do harm for it. Note that the protagonists of the show are a nurse, a high school teacher, and a retail worker. All underpaid people. Lex works the toy zone after dropping out of high school. She steals a Wiggly to sell so her boyfriend, the perfect himbo Ethan, and her younger sister Hannah can escape her abusive mom and leave town. While under the influence of Wiggly, Tom takes that doll from Hannah. It's Lex who stops him and wakes him up from the influence of advertising. Did Tim ever say he wants to tickle me, Wiggly? You know how many kids I got asking about it? None. The thing about Wiggly that nobody's talking about is kids don't want that piece of shit. A lot of people, like Tom, are trying to fix the holes with products because we've been told they can do that. As the show puts it, You think Wiggly can fix this hole, but Wiggly is a fucking lie. If he's not the answer, then what is? Tom finds that some of the holes can be fixed by talking his emotions out in the song, If I Fail You. She liked to loosen me up just to get at my heart. At the end of the play, Paul and Emma come and find him because of Tim. Emma, I've been avoiding it for too long. I think it's time we finally sit down as a family and talk about Jane. Tom's character arc is about what our values are and what we do with our time here. The show is telling us to spend time with our loved ones rather than focusing on what commodity we think they want, and that we don't heal by buying things, but by talking, connecting, opening up to each other emotionally. I think it connects with me so deeply because for me, that's what Christmas represents, but also because I have attended a lot of December funerals and reconnecting with my loved ones at times like this have been what get me through those difficulties. My Mundown video touches a little bit on one such loss. But I also connect with this message because two years ago I went home for Christmas after the worst month of my life. 
Things have been getting worse over time with my abusive roommate, and it was a conversation with my cousin that helped me process what was happening and get that person out of my life. I don't think I'd be here today without that connection and emotional honesty and vulnerability. I know from the response to my video on Midnight Mass that opening up about our experiences can help others who are struggling with the same experiences. Products can't fill those holes, but love and understanding and connection can. For me, the holiday season is a bright spot in a long night of winter where we bring warmth to each other with care and connection, and it's beautiful to see that represented within the show. We may want many things, but I know that what we need is each other, the people in our lives who reflect love in abundance. But there's no end, there's no end, there's no end to how much I love. I feel like if we can survive today, we can survive anything. Black Friday tells us to not let the superficial commercial elements get in the way of what really matters, and that the reason it can is because of systemic factors and manipulation. While many Christmas stories are about critiquing individuals for over-engaging in capitalism, they only critique the individual. I think what fundamentally makes Black Friday such a unique and powerful piece is that it critiques the systemic primarily using its supernatural elements to enhance its very real frustration with how capitalism has converted something built for human connection to being about commodification. When we look at other Christmas stories, like my personal favorite, A Christmas Carol, at no point does it say that the fundamental system that creates poverty should be dismantled, merely that rich individuals should be kinder to others damaged by the system. But why should we limit ourselves to imagining kindness within a system of harm when we can imagine a world where that system no longer exists? I think we need more art that asks. What if tomorrow comes and takes the night away? Thank you all for watching. I hope you have a lovely, warm end of the year spent with people who bring joy to your life. Special thank you to my patrons for your support, to my wonderful friends and family who help me feel that tomorrow will come today. I'll see you next month for a more in-depth piece.